All right, good morning, everyone. I'd invite all those who are still out in the corridor, the entryway, come on in, have a seat. It's good to be together today. We have a wonderful service planned today. So glad that you're here. And uh, we have some guests with us you will be meeting uh, or seeing again uh, in just a moment, the Zerbies. But uh, before that, I have some announcements for you. Uh, we are, of course, entering our summer schedule, so we're meeting at 10. Anybody show up at 9.30 this morning? Don't be embarrassed. Raise your hand. Okay, a few, yeah. All right. So there's nothing wrong with that. Come on. Come on early. Some of us will be here. And, uh, but uh, services during the summer start at 10 o'clock. And, of course, during the summer, we do have some times that we have planned for outdoor services. We'll be announcing those in due time. Also, today, after the service, I hope you're signed up. We have lots of people coming. Please join us for a barbecue that we have uh, along with the Zerbies uh, that they're going to be sharing more with us after they share some with us this morning. So please come to that. Join us for that. Uh, we look forward to eating together, being together, celebrating, and listening uh, to their update as well. Tonight, we have an evening service at 6.30. It is a hymn sing, and there will be refreshments afterwards. Uh, also, please sign up along the, the wall of the gym, this wall of the gym. There is a bulletin board with different sign-ups on it. Uh, there is a men's breakfast on the 11th of June that you can sign up for. That is from 7 to 8. So men, please sign up for that. Come on out, it's going to be a great time. Uh, for those of you who were there the last breakfast we had, you can testify to that. And uh, also for Father's Day, there will be pie. That's an important announcement. It's written here in my paper, so I know it's important. There will be pie, so fathers, don't eat breakfast, okay? That's what pie is for on Father's Day. And also, uh, during the month of August, uh, between, uh, excuse me, the 15th uh, through the 20, 20th is uh, our VBS that we have planned. Uh, if you are not already signed up to help for that, I believe there might be a sign up still out there, please see uh, that sign up or co talk with Pastor Scott or Robin Binley. And you can find out more information about that, of the way that you can get involved. It is a great opportunity. Uh, and that VBS is going to have the theme of Pilgrim's Progress. Look forward to that and ministering together. So find out a way that you can serve and be part of that great ministry opportunity. We are called to be more than spectators in life. Sometimes we're so busy, we just want to disconnect, right? We don't want to do anything else. Okay, for men, that's a nothing box. For women, I don't know what that is. Uh, but we just want to disconnect. We want to disengage. And we want no one else to be peering in or holding us accountable in our lives. Yet as a church, as the family of Christ, we are called to so much more than that. Listen to what God's word says in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 13. It says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In, in the same way, excuse me, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Can we join together? Can we stand together and uncover the glory the salt that God has put in us to make us salt and light to the earth and shine 
outwardly into the darkness that he's placed us. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you that you have made us much more than spectators. Father, as we sing to you this morning, as we listen to you this morning, Lord, I ask that you would make us salty again. Father, that you would refresh us, Father, that we might be a bright, shining light to the world around us, that we might sing as we live at a volume that everyone can hear. To you be all glory and honor and power. Amen. Yeah. 
Lord and Father, we do indeed surrender all to you. We need you, Lord. We need your great name. We need you to be our redeemer, our healer, our Lord, our almighty God, our defender, our savior. Lord, we surrender everything that we have to you this morning. Father, work in our hearts that we might understand afresh today, that, Lord, that you have made us new creations through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we need you and your great name. Amen. Amen. Please have a seat. As Jesus looked out in Matthew 9 upon the crowds, he looked out at all these people, and it says that he had compassion on them. And as he did, you would think being Lord and Savior, he would then do something right away. He would just go out there and do something. And he said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So pray, therefore, to the Lord of the harvest that he would send. And that's just what God did in Brian and Jen uh, Zerby's life. And I'd like to invite them now to share with us a little bit. And this is a teaser, folks. So please come and uh, join us for our barbecue afterwards. Brian and Jen and Elise, welcome here this morning. Go ahead. Thank you. So much. Yeah, it's great to be uh, with you. And we appreciate your ongoing uh, prayer, your partnership with us in Tajikistan, which is surprisingly stable considering all that's happening in the part of the world it's a slide where it is, just north of Afghanistan and, and the um, former Soviet countries these days. Um, we're glad to be back. Um, you can advance the slide. And again, we're just going to be giving a few quick snippets um, with pictures here that there's stories of God's beautiful and messy work in people's lives that um, afterwards during the barbecue, maybe we'll have some more time to share some of that. Um, this is our family. Only Elise is with us now. Our three older children, we're in that stage now where we're sending them back off to university. So instead of family pictures like this, usually our family pictures look like this uh, now. But as our family in Tajikistan shrinks, our team is growing. You can advance the slide. And we have, um, even this summer, while we're here, this month, there's a new family coming and another gal allowing some of the work that we're doing at the clinic to expand. Um, we just started nutrition consultations, giving a chance to connect with people in their homes in a new way where we can share and sit and pray with them um, and hoping to start infectious disease specialties and expand primary care this year with some of the new families coming, new people. Um, we appreciate your continued prayers for our clinic staff. We have about a quarter of them, four out of over 20 are believers, and uh, we work a lot with them helping them to reach out both to the patients. We have over 60 patients coming in from around the country, referred into the, the clinic where I'm involved in the eye care side, and that's the busiest part of the clinic. Um, and also reaching out to the rest of the staff. You can advance the slide. Uh, we have, uh, again, over 20 staff where we have spend time in the Word together and sometimes get out from the clinic situation into uh, the country into camping, you can advance the slide. Um, took several, 30 to 40 uh, staff and family camping last summer, taking them on hikes, getting them out, ways to connect, and again, chances to share more with them and share the Lord outside of the busy, stressful clinic setting. Um, I think I'll let Jen, actually, oh, sorry, one more, you can advance the slide. Um, one other thing that we've really enjoyed this year has been partnering with some friends with a group that is reaching into neighborhoods in Tajikistan, in the city capital, Dushanbe, and trying to see groups started in these different neighborhoods that are reading the word together. And we've enjoyed coaching along with them, with this group of four or five, um, so something to pray with them that they can um, see God work in different neighborhoods right in, within the city. All right, and then the next slide. Yeah, so just about a bit of what we're, I'm doing more of. Um, we just moved to a new house. Um, some friends are in the neighborhood and uh, had four teens in the household that are just really having some tough times and to have 
uh, the moms who I've been friends with for a long time say, will you please teach our kids how to live? They just need help. And so just gathering with them um, once a week to uh, just hang out, play some games, uh, get into the word together, and just talk about this and get a new perspective of what it is to have hope and, and what does God desire for us. So working with, um, with the moms, of course, as well, and their family has been a, a blessing this past season. The last picture we have, um, ask me at the barbecue about Rustam. Um, I'll just uh, leave him there. Just He's a good illustration of God's kind of beautiful and very messy work as we see God working in leaders, um, Tajik believing pastors and leaders like Rustam. Um, and you can ask, ask at the barbecue after. So thank you so much for your ongoing prayer. Thank you, Brian and Jen. It's good to have you here. We're looking forward to hearing more from you. I'd like to invite the children, grades one through four, forward for our pocket promise box. All right. Anybody know? Put it on. Anybody know? But I got a wire on. Anybody know what this is? Headlamp? Yeah. Well, I can't help but think about God's word, which is a lamp to our feet. And uh, when I see this, I don't have one, someday maybe, um, but when I see this, that's what I think about. I think about the, the fact that God's word is a torch, it's a light, and it helps us to know the way that we ought to go to stay on the right path. And I hope that today in God's word, in Children's Church, you learn something about him that you never knew before. All right, let's pray together. Father, thank you for these younger ones. I pray that you'd help us to teach them, love them, guide them. Pray that we'd not confuse them in any way. Pray that your word would be light for them. Pray that having had the way lit up, that they would in fact be salt and light for you. And we ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. Brothers and sisters, it is a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Today is a full day in the house of the Lord. And we're so thankful for that, the, the wonderful concurrence of events where we've got some, uh, just some really special things. We've got time together in worship and time together in baptism, special missionaries visiting with us and giving us an update and a report and even a time to break bread or break hamburgers together, and thank the Lord for that. So, But if you have your scriptures, I invite you back to the book of Exodus. We have been here now for 20, this is our 27th week. We've been studying God's great rescue story. We're actually on number eight of a list of 10 of God's words of life. So this is a series within a series. Don't be confused by that. And this morning we find ourselves in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 15. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 15. We're joining with the ancients around Mount Sinai and we're listening to God's words of life. To not merely the Ten Commandments, but to a tender word from a loving father who instructs us and warns us and guards us in the way that we ought to go. First, we said, put God first. Second, make no substitute. Third, dignify God's name. Four, remember the Sabbath. Five, honor your parents. Six, value human life. Seventh, last week, keep your vows. And number eight this morning, respect others' property. Respect others' property. Let's read together the word of the Lord, just four words this morning. Verse 15, you shall not steal. You shall not steal. This is God's word to us today, church. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for all that you've done for us. We feel something like turtles on fence posts. We know we're not here of our own. Father, we thank you for the word of life. Father, for the more 
general gospel message that we were needy, condemned before you in your holiness, and you have provided a way of escape through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Father, we worship you and we serve you. Even as it's been mentioned, Lord, we, we recognize the day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess your great name. Father, we, we are privileged to do that now as worshipers. Father, I pray that you'd hear our cries. Lord, I ask now that your word would be active in our hearts, that God the Spirit would deal with our consciences and our minds and our hearts. We don't want to simply hear it and do nothing about it or go away. Father God, we pray that you'd be active. Uh, Father, I thank you for the friends that have come, the family that are here. I, I thank you even for the glad occasion of missions update and, and baptism observance. All of this wonderfully superintended by you. And we thank you, Lord. Would you help me now to be a help to your people? Would you shepherd my heart, mind, and mouth that, Father, you would lead your people in green pastures beside still waters? Father, bless our, our dear Zerbies who have, who have just been through something hard as a family. And, Father, there's a keenness to the, the loss and the frailty of life. And so, Father, would you come and help us? Make this, mark this as a sweet time of fellowship and reporting. Father, we know well the ups and downs of life on planet Earth. And so, come, Lord, and secure us. And we ask this in the strong name of Christ, our Savior. Amen. You've probably heard the story about the New York couple that received in the mail two tickets to a Broadway musical. Strangely, when the gift arrived, there was no note attached to it. They wondered who sent them. However, they attended the show and they enjoyed it immensely. And when they returned home, they discovered that their home had been ransacked, that a lot of valuables and furs and some works of art were now missing and left on the pillow was a simple note that simply said, now you know. Now you know who sent the tickets. Let me put it together, the thieves sent the tickets. <laughs> if you weren't sure about that. Stealing is epidemic in our culture. It occurs on ingenious and spectacular levels like that couple, but it also occurs in much more subtle ways. As humans, we know what it's like to, to lust after, to desire things. And I'm amazed over the years at how quickly and easily and readily possessions become obsessions. We assume, we begin to assume that we need goods and we need gear and we need trinkets and we need toys to be happy. But the God who knows us gives to us from his hand a letter of love and truth, a letter that prevents us and calls us away from the kind of sin that wounds and destroys us. The very destruction of human experience is that sort of green-eyed jealousy, lust for things and not for him and not for people. Very easily, we can track towards desiring things, things that can never ultimately satisfy even an eight-year-old Jeep Wrangler could become an obsession. <laughs> so be careful. Enjoy the blessings and the mercies of God, but see them as gifts from on high. So we're working our way through these 10 words of life. And here we are brought again, I think, to recognize something of the character of God. God is not a thief. God does not lie. God does not break covenant. God needs nothing. And so we see even behind the commandments, the, the wonder of who God is. And themes like loyalty and worship and integrity and rest and respect surface throughout the study as we mine them for truth. Well, this morning with the moments that I have, I, I want to try to answer three questions. What is stealing? Why do we steal? And what happens when we don't steal? And the positive, when we obey, when we follow through, when we, we hear well the warning of God and we, we, we refrain from theft, 
What is it that we can expect? And so first of all, a definition, what is stealing? The guardrail placed for us today is brief but potent, you shall not steal. In the Hebrew, it's just two words, loganab, no stealing. The literal force of it is something that you get by stealth, you, you deceive, you carry away. The Eighth Commandment here speaks of taking something, anything that doesn't belong to you. I was thinking this past week of one of my earliest memories of theft, and it would probably go back to my days in Holly Drive in Hatboro, Horsham, 19040. I remember the older boys in the neighborhood had stolen some watermelons from a local farmer's market, Ciasoni's. And I remember pondering that. So you just, you guys like snuck out of your home at night, you stole these watermelons and were eating them, you didn't pay for them. That was probably one of my first recollections of stealing in my youth. Theft refers to any act by which a person wrongfully deprives another person of their property. Some of you probably will remember one of the more famous from God's word, Ahab, King Ahab, stealing a vineyard from Naboth. He sees it, he wants it. Ultimately, he pouts to his wife Jezebel, who puts together a plan to make sure that her pouting husband gets Naboth's vineyard. Naboth is slain. Ahab gets to take it. And the mouthpiece of God shows up saying, what have you done? Because God knows all and God sees all. Someone else's stuff becomes precious to us. Of course, even that term, you can't help but maybe think of Gollum or Smeagol. My precious. <laughs> it's what happens. That's, that's the condition of the human heart. I want it. They have it. I want it. So what is it that God is condemning in this passage? He's condemning simply taking what is not ours. And scripture repeatedly and forcefully speaks of this sin. It, stealing shows up early in God's word, and it shows up often in God's word. Think about it. What does Eve do in Genesis 3? She steals fruit that is not her fruit. Even the verse sin in Israel, when they're in the land, what happens? Well, Achan steals gold and silver and Babylonian raiment that he's not to have. What's the first sin of the infant church? Acts 5, Ananias and Sapphira, lying and stealing some of the dividends, wanting to appear more spiritual than they are and holding back, probably for security purposes, some of the funds. This command becomes a clarion call away from something present and pervasive to humanity. We steal. It's one of the things that mark us as humans. As you know, right now, we have two precious grandkids living in the house, and it's happening to them, too. We're dealing with that as well. Why? Because we are terminally human. And unless God in his grace, unless God with his truth comes marshalling towards our hearts and souls, we will continue on that trajectory. Scripture is also highlighting the merits, I think, here of personal property. I'm not being political to say that we are personally allowed to oversee and steward resources that he loans to us. So just to note here, the socialistic ideal that what's yours is mine or that it all belongs to the state or to the collective is impossible to harmonize with the text that's before us here in God's word. Stealing has massive implications for our nation. Do you know that 5% of what we spend goes to cover business losses from theft? And I remember from the business world, one of the interesting terms that they use for this, it's not theft, it's called shrinkage, which is kind of like a nice way of saying. So money is, is being laid aside to cover shrinkage, actually to cover our sin as humans. Statistics tell us that many employees steal about one day of work each week, goofing off, wasting time, or using work time personally. 
And so we feel the force of this truth. God's not talking about something like, I don't know what he's talking about. What is he talking about? We all know something about this. It was old John Gill that I thought summarized it well, and I'll give you something of his rogues gallery here. He says, thefts are of various kinds. There is private theft, picking of pockets, shoplifting, burglary, or breaking into houses in the night and carrying off goods, public theft, or robbing upon the highways, domestic theft, as when wives take away their husband's money or goods and conceal them or dispose of them without their knowledge and will. Children rob their parents, servants purloin their master's effects. Ecclesiastical theft or sacrilege and personal theft as stealing of men and making slaves of them, selling them against their wills. And we could add to this the more subtle forms of theft, stealing a reputation by slander, stealing intellectual property, plagiarism, stealing moral purity from another, stealing by borrowing and not returning, stealing through false weights and measures. We could go on and on, but some of you are saying, mercy. But you get the point. Stealing is a big deal. We must as well resist the urge to justifying our theft. I think the rationale goes something like this. People steal from me, therefore I am... I am okay with stealing because I've been stolen from. And so we kind of do these little sort of gymnastics in our mind trying to defend our own sin, find ways to explain away our infractions. I read about a man who who stole a car that was parked near a cemetery because his assumption was the person was dead. Like he drove there, got out, got into his box, All kinds of strange ways to do that. So that's a definition of what is stealing. And it's an ugly portrait, I'll give you that. And yet we'd be honest enough that we have contended with these types of things. And so to hear from the Most High God that a, a guardrail has been placed in our path to keep us from this sin for our good and for his glory, it should not surprise us. That's what stealing is. Well, what's, what's the cause? Why do we steal? Not do why do people steal, but why do we steal? And I've been helped here by Ron Meal. I want to make sure, having said something about plagiarism, that you know I'm standing on other people's shoulders. <laughs> First of all, because we want to be popular. One of the reasons that we steal is because we want to be popular. Proverbs 19.4 says, Wealth brings many new friends, but a poor man is deserted by his friend. People will steal to possess the resources to make them a part of the in crowd. Even we've, We've even known the process of of being a window shopper and seeing clothes in a window case and thinking, if I just had that, I might be invited to the cool kids' table. I might finally find myself with the status that I have so longed for. So sure, money attracts friends, it's true, but my follow-up question is, and yes, what kind of friends does it attract? But that's beside the point. Think of the parable of the parable, the prodigal son, the lost little brother. He's flush with funds and everyone's around him. After he spent it all on riotous living, we find him alone, pathetic in the pig pen. The very picture of isolation. There are those who, like flies to stink, shallow beholders of the face, who will congregate to admire our newest acquisition with a kind of green tint in the air. But that's not the friends that we should want. Or even stop and think about those who we know who were once uber rich, sought after the notable, and now they live in squalor. They're now the unseen, the forgotten, even the loathed. Great has been their fall. So gaining riches for attention and popularity is a lousy, soul-deadening enterprise. God's word would tell us today, stay away from that swamp. Why do we steal? Because we want to be popular. 
Secondly, because we believe that it will somehow, some way make us happy. God has pledged to us great and precious promises, but when we strike out on our own, we forget those precious promises. We think somehow that these things will make us happy. The deceiver convinces us that having something, anything, will lift our spirits and cheer us. It's a kind of consumer therapy. It's on its way, you know. Amazon has something coming to my door. You get that marvelous box with the smiley face on it, and you open it up immediately. And of course, it's fullness of joy forevermore, right? Wrong. This looks nothing like the picture. (laughs) What was I thinking? We know, we know that, don't we? I'll have that. That will make me happy, and it doesn't. The fallen world tells us that hankering for someone else's gear is, is normal. It's not devilish. That greed is good. It's not the symptom of a sick, empty soul. And so we fail to realize that stealing is incredibly costly. Think about Achan in Joshua 7, who takes the accursed things, running away from God, living in rebellion, and then judged in the wrath of God for his sin. Proverbs 15, 16 offers us a better word. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. Stuff doesn't satisfy. If it did, our happiest folks would be our richest folks. So why aren't they? Theft is one of the marks of a rebel heart. You can never steal enough to be contented. Third reason, because we desire security, we wrongly believe that we can stockpile security, that we can insulate ourselves against the storms of life. But our love affair with money becomes a dead-end street. Aching and taking and grabbing never results in security. Brothers and sisters, here again, the wise counsel of the word of the Lord, Proverbs 23, verse 4. Do not toil, overwork to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to desire, to desist or to stop doing that. Goes on to say, when your eyes light on it, it is gone, for suddenly it sprouts wings, flying like an eagle towards heaven. I got it, I got it, I finally got it, and now it's gone. What better perspective, what a powerful counterbalance is given to us in Psalm 16, verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad. And my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. You thought it was stuff? You're wrong. It's the Savior. You you, you thought it was having loads of things? You're wrong. It's the Lord that satisfies. Oh, brothers and sisters, I don't know who needs to hear this, but listen to the word of the Lord. 1 Timothy 6, verse 17, Paul tells Timothy that the rich must not set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth, but on God. And so if you're here this morning, you've seen wealth sort of drifting away, and you're wondering, am I still secure? My 401 has become a 201. I don't know what I'm going to (laughs) do. Is God still on the throne? Will he provide for me? Trust in God, not in stuff. I grew up as a missionary kid, told you these stories. I don't want to bore you with them. But I saw God provide again and again and again and again. And God will be faithful to his children. I had the kind of experiences that you would expect from a George Mueller. We had reefer trucks, reefer refrigeration trucks, sorry. break down near where we lived. Could you guys use some frozen goods? It's going to go bad. We sure can. Bring it on into this massive deep freeze. It's almost empty. The goodness of God in caring for his people. 
Sometimes we think, oh, we'll be secure. And we're not, we're more insecure. For a later time, Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 to 11, God says, don't rob me. Don't rob me by holding back your tithe. There is something about the exercise of grace giving that is good for our hearts and souls. I need to give. Otherwise, my heart, my mind, my soul shrinks. I need to let go. Give to God's work so that I don't find myself living with a kind of skin flint attitude towards everything. Fourthly and finally, why do we steal? Because we've forgotten God's promise of care. We're to work hard, we're to be diligent, we're to meet our obligations, go to the ants thou sluggard. But realize that we still need God's provision. If, if we don't believe God, if we can't rest in him, we'll always find ourselves taking matters in our own hands. And one of the ways we do that is by stealing. It's in this command that we hear God's voice saying, I, I don't want you stealing because I am your provider. Don't steal. I'll provide for you. Give, be gracious, be like the Macedonians. Give, and I'll provide for you. To be a schemer, a manipulator, deceiver means that you fail to understand that God furnishes what you require to live. And when we steal, we're assuming that God cannot provide for us. We become usurpers, discontented with the job that he's doing. It's a rebellion. It's an insurrection against him. We find ourselves like Smog the dragon, isolated, sitting on a big pile of gold. And that's not God's plan for his children. Our future rests in his care. We're turning our lives, our eternal souls over to him. And so we're struggling with the providences of God in the smaller, more physical aspects. Do you realize how strange that seems? It's a kind of it's a kind of practical atheism. I believe you, Lord. I trust you. We sang it today. I need you. But I'm really going to need this stuff because I'm not sure if you're going to be faithful. All of a sudden, we've cut ourselves off from the very truth that we so desperately need to live out. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 says it well. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Achan ends his life in the valley of trouble because he forgets God. He forgets his promises, and so trouble loiters nearby. So the definition, what is stealing? Hopefully it's been set before you. The cause, why do people steal? Because we want to be popular. We think it will make us happy. We desire security. We have forgotten God's promise of care. And I'm sure we could add to that list. Thirdly and finally and briefly, the cure. What, brothers and sisters, results when by the grace of God, in the mercy of God, we refuse the, the tug, the undertow of the cosmos, and we live against the grain. We swim against the current. I've got three quick words for you. Delightful freedom. To trust in the Lord and lead hard upon his provision is to live with a kind of joy-filled contentment. And we know it's not simply having things, it's wanting what we have. Contentment is really containment. I have what I need, praise the Lord for that. Do, do I have all the little extras? No, I don't need the little extras. But I need him and I want him. So there's delightful freedom no fear, no shame, no sickening, threatening revelations are possible. God's word declares in Ephesians 4, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, what is good. And listen to the rationale, listen to the reason behind this, that he may have something to give to him who has need. What a great word from our master and savior and king. So what's the result of obeying? and refusing to steal delightful freedom. Secondly, this, glory for God. One of the things that comes out of the book of Titus, and if you don't know it, the Cretans where Titus is called to minister have kind of a really bad reputation. Lazy and slow bellies, and they don't tell the truth, and, 
They're just folks you don't want to emulate. And so God sends his man Titus to be the pastor shepherd there. And there's this amazing change that's occurring in the life of the Cretans. Even the Cretans. They have stopped purloining. Purloining, you say? They have stopped stealing. I mean, that was like their way of life. That was their MO. What marks them now as new creatures? No more stealing, no more robbing. Go ahead, keep, keep the doors open. Don't, don't lock your doors at night. Wonderful, glorious work of God in that culture, calling them away from that kind of theft. So there was glory for God. Their, their lives became vivid with the change that had occurred in them because of the gospel's work. And thirdly and finally, blessing for God's people. Blessing for God's people. Zacchaeus wasn't just vertically challenged. He was morally challenged. And so when he meets Jesus that day and he hears Zacchaeus, you come down from going to your house today. There is a marvelous transference that occurs that Jesus would meet with a guy who is known as an extortionist and theft and that Jesus' gracious love for this man would result in his repentance and rescue, him turning away from sin, him essentially saying, half of my goods I, I give to the poor, and if I've taken anything, if I've extorted anything, I'm returning fourfold. So the total reordering of his priorities. All he cared about before is stuff, and now all he cares about is the Savior. A Savior who would come to his house, fellowship with him, desire to know him and love him, which is the result of the wondrous gospel. Grace flowed where, great, where greed once had flowed, and it's marvelous to behold. God is glorified there. And so it's for that reason that we have been reading together week after week after week a little bit of verse from Isaac Watts that's been adapted and I'm praying and hoping that God the Father would sear it into our consciences. And so if you take your little insert, get ready for the exercise, let's read together this delightful little primer of truth for how we as the people of God ought to be living. Ten words of life. You shall have no gods but me. Before no idol, bend your knee. Take not the name of God in vain. Dare not the Sabbath to profane. Give honor to your parents, you. Make sure that no murder do. Keep yourself from all unclean. Steal not, though poor and lean. Make not a willful lie and love it. What is your neighbor's do not covet. Amen. God's in the business of changing people. It is our privilege to be able to witness the change that is occurring in four people this morning. And so let's prepare our hearts for that. And I'll ask the candidates to go ahead and, and get themselves ready for that. The call of God upon our lives as the people of God is repent and be baptized. And here is an open and public display of loyalty to the living Lord. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for words of wisdom and words of truth. And Father, we do pray that you would help us. We know that a, apart from your sustaining grace, apart from your convicting grace, that we could not and would not change. And so, Lord, I thank you for the work that has, that has gone on in, in our hearts as your people. I pray that we would hear this word of life and that we would, that we would ad adopt and understand its truth for us. Lord, help us to live it out. Give us the power through God the Spirit. Help us to abide under your influence in glorious ways. And Father, I pray that even as we prepare now to, to, to view baptism and to see externally what's been going on internally, we thank you for that. And we praise your name in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to join in worship. 
as we continue our service. This is a new song with some familiar words. As our focus remains on our, our Lord and Savior this morning. Christian my whole life, but I never really um, applied it. Uh, like I knew different stuff from going to pioneer clubs, stock haters, but I never really grew from it. Like I took in all the information, but I never really, nothing super changed um, until a few years ago when I was 12. I went I've been going to Camp Pinnacle uh, during the summers throughout my entire life. And uh, a few years ago, um, there's a dedication fire. And each dedication fire is Thursday night, the final night at camp. 
we were up at the dedication fire having worship. Um, I closed my eyes during worship, like one of the first few times I'd completely shut my eyes while worshiping. Um, and I felt like it was, it was different. Like I felt like I wasn't only singing in front of people. I didn't really think of them. It felt like I was just singing in front of God. And when the song was over, I'd open my eyes. I'm like back in front of everyone. And at that moment, I knew that I was saved at that time that I had accepted him into my heart. And it was a really weird feeling that I can't really completely explain, but it was uh, really good. Um, and from there on, he continued to help me and uh, grow me uh, and just change me for different things. Uh, some uh, different things that he's helping me with uh, and helped me with were my attitude. Uh, I never used to have like a terrible attitude, but he's definitely grown me in there. The way that I have treated people in not only to them, but around them and helping them also grow. That's one of the things um, I want to grow more in. Uh, I want to grow more in sharing. I feel like I still become somewhat nervous when I'm sharing the gospel to others, especially people my age, because I don't know their response. So that's definitely something I, I still need growth in. Um, and I hope that I can just learn to grow further. So I had gone to Pioneer Clubs like since I was uh, little, so I'd kind of always been like, okay, God, sure, like whatever, but I'd never really given it like too much thought until like middle school, and then I kind of didn't really like believe what like was being like said there, so I would like started coming up with like questions to like kind of try and disprove God sort of, and like they were, I wasn't looking for an actual answer. But then um, I was at camp two summers ago, and um, we were in the tab, and we were praying. And um, that night, God kind of just changed my heart, and, like, he became real to me that night, and that led me to accepting him as my personal savior. And then I started being more interested in, like, learning about him and digging into his word. And... Uh, most of the questions that I'd come up with, like, they were answered, like, um, and um, so he started um, working in my life and changing um, my mindset and things, um, like, not holding on to things like bitterness, which was a lot easier, to, like, to do before I knew God, and um, He's also helping me be less anxious and not having to know what is com like exactly coming next, and um, like because he's in control, so like I don't need to worry about that stuff. And he's also helping me to prioritize like my relationship with him, like especially with doing the full IB diploma program at school, and to just like make sure I sit like sp specific times in the day where I just set aside everything else and just like pray and like be in the word and when I do this I get like his peace and like feeling like whole whereas when I, on days that I don't do that I tend to get like more overwhelmed with my schoolwork and uh, thinking about things like exams for um, AP and IB or like college so it kind of helps to just like recenter myself and kind of refocus and um, kind of just slow down and be intentional in each day like that I have because like we're not promised tomorrow but like all we can do is kind of live in the right now. So. I have Michael here uh, this morning in the tank. Michael, are you are you trusting in Jesus Christ alone as your Savior? Yes. Do you want people to know that you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes. 
Michael, on the basis of your confession of faith, you want to hold on? On the basis of your confession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. here and I just like to say that well am I talking to it now I just want to say that I'm proud of all the young people up here getting baptized because it's it's not easy to get up in front of people and you know talk or do anything but you guys are doing good so let's pray for them <sighs> father we uh, we lift up Michael we lift up Kathy we lift up Clarence and we lift up uh, Missy I believe we lift them up to you today. I specifically ask that you will just be with Michael as he starts this journey or as he continues this journey with you. We pray that you will just keep his eyes fixed upon you no matter what comes. We pray that you'll keep him grounded in you and we just pray that you'll keep him safe and that you will guard him against the attacks of the enemy because they will come, rest assured. We ask that you will just show each and every one of us here in this church how we can come alongside of him, how we can be there for him, and how we can disciple him in this walk, in this declaration that he has made to follow you. Father, we ask that you will just keep him safe and that you will just continue to speak through him to those around him. And in your name we pray, amen. Amen. Michael, following hard after Jesus Christ. Michael's sister, Catherine, we have here with us this morning as well. Catherine, thank you for your testimony. Do you recognize that Jesus Christ alone is the Savior of your soul? Yes. Are you determined to let other people know that you're a follower of his and so that they can pray for you and encourage you on that journey? Yes. Yes. Well, Catherine, on the basis of that confession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Father, we are so thankful for sweet Catherine and her example and her commitment. I just ask that her desire to learn more about you would just deepen and deepen over time. I'm so thankful to see her growth and her passion to study from you and your word and apply it to her life. I pray also that we as a church family would just come around her and love on her as she continues to learn more about you and your love for her. Amen. Amen. Hi, my name is Clarence, and my life like, was like when I met Jesus was awful. I used to steal, lie, and do other bad things. And now, and then I realized I needed him more, more and more every day. And every time I tried to turn away, it just hurted a lot. I came to know him as my savior when I was in the darkest part of my depression, when I was in the, wait, yeah, when I was in my darkest, the deepest of my depression. And I realized that I needed him here and there, but, and then I realized I needed him everywhere, wherever I go. He saved me from my sins that I couldn't do that for myself. He saved me, became my Lord and Savior, he became my father. He's working in my life right now to change me. I have lied less than I used to, and I've, and I've loved my siblings more than I usually do. 
I made some new friends in my new in the, my school. I helped a girl out when she from the dorms that she came to our school. I helped her out. She didn't do any of the bad things my friends are doing right now, and she became more like me. I want to know this is a good privilege, and I'm and I just hope you're all supportive. This is Clarence Camp. I want you to know something about Clarence. He, uh, he wanted to be baptized here before they moved because you are the folks that know him and have loved him over the long years. So we're thankful for that. But uh, Clarence, let me ask you the question. Are you trusting in Christ as your Savior alone? Yes. Do you want people to know and to pray for you as you have begun this journey that God would bring you safely, finally, fully home? Yes. Clarence, on the basis of your confession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. to pray for Clarence here today, but uh, I've gotten to watch this young man throughout his entire life, and uh, yeah, he's had a rough beginning, but God has obviously, in the last year and a half, done a major work in your life, and I've seen it. What you're doing here today is just recognition of what God's done in your life, and you'll get to hold on to this, knowing that now you've publicly made that statement before us in the world that God has done that work in your life. He's changed you. He's made you a new creation. You're not what you used to be, and you never will be. So continue on with that. Stay close to the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, I am so thankful. I'm just so excited for Clarence in his life, Lord. Uh, what you've done there, what you've brought him through in bringing him to this, and how you're changing him for the future, Lord God. Thank you so much. We love him. We pray that you continue to work in his life, continue that change. It's just so exciting, Father, to see this. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Hi, I'm Melissa Schrader, or you may know me as Missy Schoonmaker, Barb's daughter, Kelly's sister. Um, as some of you may know, I was born and raised in this church. I was here three times a week. My mom made sure we were here every Sunday morning in our Sunday best. And then we stayed for Sunday school. And then we came back for teen time. And then we came back Wednesday evening for Pioneer Club. And throughout the years, I attended summer camps at Camp Pentacle, at Sagandaga. Um, so I had a great foundation um, between the church and my mom. Um, and I wouldn't be sitting right here if it wasn't for the church and my mom. Uh, as I grew up, um, I started to think that I knew what was best for me and kind of went along that line for most of my life. And I just couldn't figure out why. Why were bad things happening to me? Why me? Um, that was a famous quote for me all the time. Why me? I'm a good person. Um, you know, I'm caring, I'm loving, I'm helpful. Um, so why me? Why is my life such a disaster? Um, now I look back and I say, why not me? Because all of those times, they were based upon my decisions, um, poor decisions, and never seeking God's guidance or word. Um, and so therefore, why not me? And 
after coming to this realization, um, you know, I've, I've always believed in God, and uh, as a young child, I took him as my savior. Um, and I thought that that's good. You know, I, again, I'm a good person, and uh, I've accepted Christ into my heart. Um, so what's going on? Um, and uh, things didn't get better. Um, you know, I would uh, thought I had it all. Uh, you know, the nice house and, and the family, and uh, you know, and then I would lose uh, all of those good worldly things. And again, why me, God? Why me? And I would always turn to Him in anger and blame Him. I never took accountability for my actions and my inactions to seek Him. Um, and this, this was most of my life. Um, recently my dad, uh, passed, and, a uh, real turning point in my life. Um, at first I was mad at God, very, very angry with him. Uh, and I sat in our recliner in her house for about two weeks. And I didn't want to talk to anybody. I was so angry. And I just sank into the chair and I, I didn't know what to do. Um, my mom had gotten me uh, a devotional. And I reached over and I said, why not? And it, were, it was as if God said, read this, read this now. And I did. And I literally fell to my knees on the floor and just cried out to him and cried for forgiveness, cried for strength, and I cried for him to accept me back into his heart. And I know that he is always willing to do that. But throughout my life, I always felt I wasn't worthy enough of him. Um, but this pivotal turning point in my life, when my dad passed, um, even one of my children said, Mom, aren't you mad? And as I was reading through scripture, again, it just spoke to me. And it just was like God was saying, it's time. It's time, Missy. You need me. You need me in your life. And I did. I, I fell. And I said, here I am. Lord, do with me as you will, please. And I have since joined a couple of Bible studies, which are just wonderful. It's wonderful to be able to fellowship and learn. Um, I have a lot of learning to do. Um, and uh, you know, now I can't wait to come to church every Sunday. I can't wait for my Bible studies. Um, the Lord works in miraculous ways. And I am one of his miracles. And I am one of his children. And I thank him for waking me up <laughs> and, and taking me back in. And no matter how far off the path you go, he's just there. He's there to say, it's okay. I'm here for you. So I am here today to recommit myself and renew my vows to God and live in a way that honors Him. And one of my favorite verses that I have found, show me your ways, Lord, teach me your past, guide me in your truth, and teach me, for you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. And so here I am.
the good and great and relentless pursuit of the hound of heaven is part of Missy's story. And we're so thankful for it. We're so thankful for God's gracious persistence and love for this sister. Missy, are you trusting in Christ alone as your personal Lord and Savior? I am. I am. Do you want these folks to know that you're a follower of Jesus Christ and to, for them to pray for you as you follow hard after him? I do. On the basis of your confession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. pass out when he tipped you over. <laughs> I'd like, like us to pray for you. Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and salvation in you. Through baptis, or baptism that we can publicly declare our love for you. Lord, we ask for your goodness and blessings to be poured out on Melissa. We pray that you would work deeply within her heart and soul to renew and refresh her each day. Guide her footsteps, give her a hope and a vision for the future. Today the past is gone. She has been washed in your blood, loved and forgiven within the kingdom of God. Father, protect her now, wrap her in your promises, fill her heart with joy. May this day be one she cherishes and remember forever. Amen. great joys of seeing people follow the Lord in the waters of baptism is to recognize that there are opportunities for others of us to join in obedience. We're looking forward to, on June the 18th, another baptism service. It'll be at Ethan and Denise Manning's uh, pond. If you are more of an outdoorsy person, uh, we would invite you to consider following the Lord in the waters of baptism there on that day. Uh, following that, there'll be a fellowship time, but we're looking, we're looking forward to that. Uh, God's word says in the book of Acts, there is much water here. What would hinder me from being baptized? And we hope that God's word is much at work in our hearts as, uh, as brothers from the mission pursue him and others in the church pursue him. So we're looking forward to that on June the 18th. That's a Saturday. That's at 2 o'clock. Let's, uh, let's pray together. Father, thank you for these four. I pray that you would bless them, teach them, guide them. I pray that you'd protect and insulate them from any kind of, of uh, spiritual attack. I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to be found faithful in lifting them up before the throne of grace, and that we do this for your glory and honor's sake. Thank you for being the rescuer, God, and we pray that we'd be able to transmit this with all the fire of our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please stand.
Jesus, you have given us freedom. No longer bound by sin and darkness, living in the light of your goodness, you have given us freedom. Now I have resurrection power, spreading on the inside, Jesus, because you have given Father, we live today in your freedom. We live knowing that you are our Lord and Savior. Lord, I ask that if there is anyone here today that's been convicted of their own sins, of living life in their own way, Lord, they would call out to you. They would fall on their knees before you and ask for your forgiveness. Father, we thank you for the waters of baptism. Lord, we thank you that we can outwardly express what you have done inwardly in our hearts, Lord. And we ask that from this place, you would make us shining as bright stars up on top of a hilltop on a mountain for all to see, Lord. Father, that your grace would go out from the work that you have done inside of us. Lord, we thank you for your love and your grace. And for each one who has declared your name upon their lives today, Lord. Help us as a body, as a family, to support well, Lord, that we would live in unity, in one spirit, in one mind, that of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We love you, Lord. Amen. Don't forget we have our barbecue with the Zerbies this afternoon. Please stay, fellowship with us, and join us for that. Go in God's grace this week.